let's go ahead and I'm going to switch on over and we are going to show the video from Simon Cortez at Lapa Lapa's. We'll talk about um, one of their specialty dishes and also um, uh, promote their Cinco de Mayo special. So here is Lapa Lapa's and Simon Cortez. Hello, my name is Simon Cortez and I am here at Lapa Lapa Grill and Cantina. Today we will be showing you how to make a fresh ceviche. Chef David is going to show you how to do a fresh fish, fish ceviche. Um, Lapa Lapa Grill and Cantina is located on Main Street in Ellicott City. We've been here since 1999, family owned and family run. And we will be gearing up for our annual Cinco de Mayo event uh, this uh, Wednesday, May the 5th. Um, we look forward to celebrating with you and we look forward to showing you how to make ceviche. And today we are going to be preparing for you uh, a fresh ceviche. I've got Chef David who has already uh, brought out some of the ingredients and he's going to show you how you can do this at home. All right. So uh, without further ado, let's uh, let, let's get started. All right. We're going to start with uh, a fresh fillet of fish. Uh, usually we use some sort of uh, white fish and he's gonna to start to dice that up. And does it matter how big the pieces are? Well, it has to be uh, uniform. That way uniform. it looks all are the same. Okay. Fine. So that is key. We want to make sure that when, when you cut the, the fish that you're cutting it all the same size so that when it's uh, curing in the fresh lime juice that it, it, it cures uh, evenly. And you'll see some of the other ingredients that we have. Uh, white onion, tomato, serrano pepper, and you can add as much or as little of the serrano pepper as you like. Squeeze some fresh lime juice on there. And for a fillet that big, two whole limes, it should be enough? No. Yeah, probably. Depending on use, how much juice they have. Yeah, you just have to cover the fish that way. Okay, that's wonderful. Yeah, so just as long as you can uh, completely cover the fish with lime juice. Okay, so you let this cook for 24 hours. Alrighty. All right, and now that we have our ingredients, the fish has been uh, cooked, marinating in the fresh lime juice uh, for 24 hours. And you can use all kinds of seafood. You can use uh, shrimp, scallops, um, octopus. Uh, this one here is just a, um, a simple fish ceviche. And you can see that we're gonna add the diced onion, tomato, fresh cilantro, a little bit of serrano pepper, and then salt to taste, and then you see that we have a uh, fresh avocado as well. All right, and so here we go. And the serrano pepper is really kind of to taste, depending on how much heat you like, is, is, is add as much or as little as you like. And once you mix all of these ingredients together, you're probably going to want to let that um, rest for a little bit to, to, to soak in the different flavors. Maybe, uh, I don't know, uh, 15 minutes or so. And then it should be ready, ready to serve. is uh, the ceviche and we're going to top that off with some fresh avocado. So thanks to Sun Cortez from La Palapas for preparing that video for us. Um, I will now 
um, hand over the reins to Fred Campbell. Fred, are you ready? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, I think we are good to go. So I'm going to mute myself and I turn over to Professor Fred Campbell. Fantastic. Thank you very much. First, um, I'd like to thank the Howard County Historical Society for having me today. Um, and before I get into the lecture, just want to talk a little bit about sort of in general what I'm going to do. You'll notice that I am inside of my car. Um, I am at Monocacy Battlefield, which is about six miles southeast of Frederick, Maryland. Um, my plan today is to talk about the battles that occurred inside of Maryland during the Civil War um, and just show you a couple of locations uh, where those battles took place. Um, now, what ended up happening was this. We tried to go outside with the, my uh, phone. My budget for this, my production budget was at zero, and I had no money to hire an assistant to help with the camera and the microphone. So basically, it's just me. Um, and unfortunately, when we tested this about a week ago, um, everything worked fine. Uh, we didn't take into consideration that the wind would be whipping up on this field, these fields that I was walking on. So when I'm outside, it's a little bit difficult to hear me. So what we what we decided to do is we're sort of adapting and overcoming. I'm going to do some of the lecture or more of the lecture than I had planned originally inside of the, the car here. But then I will get out, show you the things that I'm talking about here. I'll be talking a little bit when I'm out of the car, but I just want to prepare you that uh, if it is really windy at that moment when I'm talking, I might fade out at those points. But the reason that I'm here is to show you some of the things that I'm talking about. So uh, just be forgiving in terms of the technology. Um, now, what I'm gonna talk about today are the battlefield, the battles that took place in Maryland. And when I first started to work on this presentation, the question came to mind, well, what exactly is a battle? Because we have other things that certainly seem like battles to the participants. We have things like raids, we have skirmishes, we even have riots where people are committing acts of violence towards one another, uh, defending a cause or defending a nation or defending an idea, and they would seem to sort of merit battles. And so the debate that I had with myself is like, what exactly is a battle? Now, um, the definition is, is somewhat loose. Um, so I had to figure out some sort of parameters. And what ended up happening was I decided to go with um, a group that I have a lot of respect for and, and something that occurred uh, about two and a half, three decades ago, uh, there was something uh, that was called together that was uh, the CWSAC, uh, which stands for the Civil War Sites Advisory Commission, which was formed in 1993. And this particular commission was sort of charged with locating all of the Civil War battlefields in America and seeing what sort of condition they were in and how well they were preserved. Um, in doing so, they came up with a list. Now, um, if you got the list of uh, web links that were sent earlier in the week to you, I'm gonna reference a few of those. I'll show a few of them also in terms of uh, on my phone here. And the very first link uh, had a picture of the state of Maryland and listed the battles that occurred um, in the, the state. Now, historically, most of these battlefields sort of hold up to the definitions that they created. Um, they listed 384 defined battlefields. And like Sean had spoken about uh, earlier, he and I early, uh, last year attempted to try to break a world record. We went to 37 in the course of 24 hours. We got really tired and just couldn't do anymore. Uh, but I thought it was a good effort on our part. Um, I've been to over 70 battles that are uh, registered with uh, the S uh, or the, the CWSAC um, and they came up with a list of seven battles that occurred in Maryland. Now there if you really want to get down to the nitty-gritty there could be other battles that uh, occurred here. Uh, they didn't list something called the Battle of Funkstown. There's a Battle of the Wagons that also occurred but I'm going to go with that definition okay and if we ever want to get into some deep conversations and philosophical ideas about those other battles, I'm more than happy to meet up with people and do that. But for our purposes, we're going to stick with the seven that they define, okay? And I'm just going to list them very quickly, and then I'm going to talk about each one. So we have the Battle of Hancock. We have the Battle of South Mountain, the Battle of Antietam, the Battle of Williamsport, the Battle of Boonesboro, 
the Battle of Nakasi, and the Battle of Folks Hill, some of which you may have heard of and are very famous, others which are extremely obscure, all of which you can go and visit in Maryland if you're so inclined. Every single one of them has at least a plaque, a memorial to it that allows you to, to read a little bit about the battle at the location, um, and you're more than welcome to do that. And just as a selfless plug, because I know that Sean did this at, or before he handed things over to me, I do um, uh, Civil War battlefield tours, and I do them at Monocacy and Antietam, and I also do custom tours if people are interested in seeing some of the smaller battlefield sites. So I'm going to follow the, um, the, the, the chronological order of these battles, and I'm going to uh, step out of the car a couple of times to show you some things, because um, six of the seven battles I can sort of connect to the Battle of Monocacy itself, which is actually going to occur um, in 1864. But we have battles occurring as early as 1862. Now, I'm going to talk about all of these battles. At the end of my presentation today, I'm probably going to be talking for about 40, 45 minutes. So just realize, A, I can't get into super in-depth on any one of these. and also. Uh, in terms of questions, I'm going to save that to the end. So if you have specific questions, type that into the chat, um, and then uh, um, uh, Sean will be more than happy to read those out at the end, and I can sort of have a little bit of a back and forth. So let's go back and start with the very first battle, which is the only battle I really can't connect to the battle uh, field of Monocacy. So I'm just going to talk about it here in the car, then I'm going to get to all the ones that I can connect to this wonderful battlefield. And that's going to be the Battle of Hancock. Now, the Battle, Battle of Hancock, which many people have never heard of, is really a, a great example of why Maryland was important in the Civil War uh, for both the North and the South. For the North, Maryland was very important because if it had left the Union, and remember, we have 11 states that have left the, uh, the United States of America, are attempting to form this thing called the Confederate States of America, and you'll have four states that are going to uh, remain in the Union, but are slave states, Maryland being one of them. Uh, for Abraham Lincoln, if Maryland, uh, if that would have been a really um, a, a difficult situation if Maryland had decided to secede, but it stays in the Union. Now, the history behind that's a little bit complicated. Abraham Lincoln will suspend habeas corpus. He will arrest a number of pro-secessionist politicians right at the beginning of, war, of the war to keep Maryland in the Union. But if Maryland had left, the capital of the United States, Washington, D.C., would have been surrounded by the Confederacy. So for the North, Maryland was a key state to hold on to. For the South, Maryland becomes extremely symbolic in a couple of ways, but also a practical target in terms of the battles that I'm going to talk about. The, uh, the symbolic aspect of it is that they saw Maryland as a state held in hostage, that really people from Maryland wanted to leave. They wanted to join the Confederacy. And so coming into Maryland and fighting on the soil would lead to an uprising of people, uh, Marylanders, and uh, liberating the state. But on a more practical level, and that deals with the very first battle I'm going to talk about, the Battle of Hancock, Maryland had economic strategic value. There are canals that are running east and west, connecting the eastern seaboard to the Midwest of the United States. There are railroads moving back and forth that are moving goods east and west and also from Maryland to the north and goods, people, and information down into Maryland. And for the Union to fight productively, they need those railroads. And so on multiple occasions, the battles that we're going to, um, uh, the, the battles that we're going to see always have some sort of economic implication to it. And so in January of 1862, we have something called the Romney Expedition. The Romney Expedition is going to start in the town of Romney, which at the moment was in Virginia, later West Virginia. And it's going to be led by a guy named, Je uh, I'm sorry, um, Stonewall Jackson, who you might have heard of. Stonewall Jackson is going to attempt to cross the Potomac River, which is the southern border of Maryland, and go in to destroy rail lines and canal networks. Um, he tries to attempt uh, that crossing around the uh, town of Hancock, Maryland. Uh, there's going to be a general there uh, by the name of Frederick Lander. This Union general is going to halt Stonewall Jackson's attempt to come into Maryland. Uh, he's, uh, Stonewall Jackson is looking at a place to ford the river. He's getting stopped left and right. He realizes he can't cross. So he's going to set up cannons on a place called Ork Hill, just outside of Hancock on the southern side of the Potomac River. 
and he's going to start to shell the town. In response to this, General Lander is going to set up cannons on hills surrounding Hancock. And from January 5th to January 6th, we're going to see an artillery exchange. So this battle is primarily an artillery duel between these two forces. Now, uh, what January 7th, Stonewall Jackson realizes he's not going to be able to cross that river, and he's going to retreat back uh, south. So the battle is quite small in terms of we measure it in terms of casualties, only 25 casualties on either side. But it's the first time we see forces, organized forces, between um, the Union and the Confederacy engage one another in the soil of Maryland, okay? Now, later on that year, in 1862, we're going to start to see larger battles occur. And that's really going to take us to the location that I'm at right now. Now, in a few moments, I'm going to step out of this car and I'm going to pan a large open field, which is known as the Best Farm. The Best Farm is part of the uh, National Battlefield of uh, Monocacy, and it will have implications for the Battle of Monocacy that happens in 1864, but it is also intimately connected to two battles that occurred in 1862. So when I step out, I'm going to show you the, 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 uh, um, the, the Best Farm. And I'm gonna show you a plaque that's going to be connected to these two battles. So let me talk about the battles real quick. Then I'll step out to clarify the things that you're gonna see. Hopefully you'll be able to hear me when I'm out there, but if not, I'll get back in the car. and I'll talk a little bit when I'm moving to my next location. So what two battles am I talking about? Well, these are gonna be the battles of South Mountain and the Battle of Antietam. In 1862, in the summer of 1862, Robert E. Lee is going to have a series of major victories against the North, culminating in the Second Battle of Bull Run slash Manassas. And just as a little side note, if you ever hear a battle in the Civil War called by two names, it's because the South would name its battles after the nearest town where that battle took place. The North would name it after the nearest body of water, which is why that battle is called the Battle of Bull Run and the Battle of Manassas. After that battle occurred, we have this, and this is second bull run, second Manassas. We're going to have the Union Army retreating into Washington, D.C. Now, Lee has a critical decision to make. Is he going to try to uh, chase the Union Army back into D.C. and fight them there? He decides that would be unwise because D.C. has fortifications around it and would lead uh, probably to massive casualties. He could stay where he is and hold on to Northern Virginia, but then that's going to be a battle of attrition, which Lee realizes all along because of the population of the North, sitting still and playing defense is not going to win the war. So he makes the decision to go North. And it's going to be the first major invasion of the North by the Confederate Army. He's going to cross the Potomac River. He's going to move all the way up to Frederick, Maryland. Now, I have a map. Uh, one of the links is the Battle of South Mountain, which is going to really help you understand the geography of what I'm going to show you in just a minute. He's going to come to Frederick. He's going to spend four days here. As they bivouac and they're camping here, Robert E. Lee and a number of his forces are going to be camped on the best farm. And it is while Lee is sitting in his tent in the best farm, figuring out sort of the next uh, move, he hears about a guy named General McCullough. Uh, or, General McCullough. Ugh, I'm starting to stutter here. Uh, uh, General McClellan is going to uh, be, is going to take over uh, the Union forces um, right when the when when Lee crosses. And McClellan is moving north. He's coming towards Frederick. Robert E. Lee decides that what he's going to do is, is make a bold move. And if you notice on that map, if you're able to to reference it, and I'm just going to show it to you very briefly here, you'll notice on the map with the red parts that I have that, on the map here. Uh, Robert E. Lee decides to break his force into five parts. Three of those parts are going to go towards Harper's Ferry, which is going to be a critical juncture between the North and the South uh, for Lee to be able to move goods and, uh, and men up to help him while he's in the North. That's held by a Union garrison. He decides to attack it. He breaks the fourth part of his army off, heads north to Hagerstown for General Longstreet to hold that, and Lee's going to be in the center making sure of coordinating these efforts. They go over, now if any, you've ever been to Frederick, Frederick is bordered by something called the Catoctin Mountains. 
Um, now I'm from Colorado, so it's hard for me to call them mountains when I have the Rocky Mountains as a reference point when I was growing up, but we'll call them mountains. The Catoctin Mountains, then there's a valley, and then there's a ridge line that's collectively known as South Mountain. And he's going to head out in that direction. So he's heading west. Uh, McClellan gets to Frederick. And if you ever want to know what the enemy is doing, the best thing to do is go through their trash wherever they were camping. You can find bits of information that might help you understand what the enemy is doing. And that's where the location that I'm going to go to in just a minute is ridiculously important. Because at this location, right along the Georgetown Pike, which is the road that I'm parked on the side of, we're going to have a cost of trees that the 27th Indiana is going to root through because we've had tens of thousands of troops moving around the best farm. In that cost of trees, these soldiers are going to find an envelope. In it, a couple cigars, and they also find an order, Special Field Order 191, which was issued by Lee, which explains to the five parts of that army what they're supposed to do. Now, you can take an entire core, well, you could spend an entire hour or two talking about this, this uh, particular order uh, and why what I'm about to tell you happened. But Lee wrote up a sixth order. It wasn't just five parts because there was a part of the army, there's debate as to whether it was acting independently or whether it was the command of another part of the army. So did this other, was this other general supposed to get these orders? Did he get them and lose them? That's, that's a, a lecture for another day. But nonetheless, that sixth order was left behind. It's found. And it moves up the, once it's found, it moves up the ranks. McClellan, he gets the order, and he says, if I can't beat Bobby Lee with this, I will go home. He knows exactly what Lee is going to do, and he starts to pursue him. So the next two battles that I'm, talking, I'm going to talk about, uh, which is the Battle of South Mountain and the Battle of Gettysburg, it's not to say that these forces wouldn't have collided, but we certainly would have seen things unfold in a very different way. There's no way that McClellan would have moved as quickly as he did in pursuit of Robert Lee. And certainly Lee would have reacted very differently if he had another day or two to act independently and act on the offensive rather than the defensive because of what McClellan knew. Now, I'm going to step out. I'm going to try to talk as loud as I possibly can. So forgive me if I fade out. I just want to kind of show you a few things. Then I'm going to get back in, talk a little bit about what happens at South Mountain and um, Antietam. So again, Forgive me for the, the, the wind if it is blowing. So, stepping out here. And just moving very quickly over my shoulder here. This is the best farm. This is where he bivouacked during those four days. Lee then heads out, spin around here. Behind me, heads west over my shoulder. Denotes where that lost order was found. Special order. Robert E. Lee wrote. Even though we're on the Battle of the Night, which happened in 1864, right where we're standing is going to be a critical moment in two battles in 1862. Now, I'm going to head back to a car, and as I'm there, I want to denote two things. One, just very quickly, and I'm fast forwarding to the Battle of Monocacy in 1864, we have behind me the monument to the Battle of Monocacy, dedicated on the 100th anniversary of that battle. And then over here, we have another memorial is dedicated by the Daughters of the Confederacy, and this is the only Confederate monument that we have on the battlefield at South Mountain. Now, I'm going to go ahead and get the car. So hopefully, you're able to hear what I said in the last couple of minutes. Give me one second. So, um, I'm going to be heading to another location. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, South Mountain and um, Antietam as I'm heading to that location. I want to denote that sort of where I'm heading, and that will help connect us when we get to the Battle of Monocacy. I'm going to be driving down the Georgetown Pike. I'm going to be going over a bridge. The modern bridge is in the exact location of a covered wooden bridge in 1864. It was actually there in 1862 also. But that wooden bridge is going to be central to the Battle of Monocacy 
uh, in July of 1864, okay? Um, and I'm gonna reference that in a few minutes when I get to that battle. So let's talk about, the, let's go back to 1862. Robert E. Lee is headed out west. McClellan is pursuing him. Uh, we're talking about 82,000 uh, uh, Union soldiers meeting about 37,000 Confederate forces. Um, Lee needs to delay McClellan. So what will end up happening, and if you look in the map that, that's denoted the uh, South Mountain, is that Lee will detach um, about 18,000 of his troops uh, under uh, uh, General D.H. Hill. And he will uh, attempt to hold three passes on South Mountain. Starting in the north, we have Turner's Gap, about a half mile south. We have Fox's Gap, and a few miles south of that, Brampton Gap. These three gaps are the only real accessible points where large numbers of soldiers can pursue. Now, uh, the attacking general is going to be a General Burnside. General Burnside will end up attacking uh, D.H. Hill's forces on September 14, 1862. And this is going to lead to the Union Army. Uh, the casualties that we have for that are going to be uh, about 2,300 Union killed and 2,600 Confederates killed. Um, now, those losses are important for both sides, but the loss itself is going to lead Robert E. Lee to start to contemplate possibly retreating back to Virginia. Um, he is not heard from Stonewall Jackson, who is supposed to have taken Harper's Ferry, uh, that he has done so. And the whole sort of plan that he had is starting to unravel. But as the next day dawns on the 15th, Robert E. Lee, Robert e. Lee will get word from Stonewall Jackson that Harper's Ferry is to fall. And that's massive. It is going to be the largest surrender of American forces uh, in history to that point. They're going to capture hundreds of wagons of the South. The Confederates are going to capture hundreds of wagons of material. They're going to capture artillery pieces. And this is going to shift Robert E. Lee's thinking from possibly retreating to, hey, things might be turning around. So he sends out scouts up and down Pleasant Valley to try to find a location to hold until, Rob, until um, Stonewall Jackson can pull enough men and material to where he is, because he's pulling Longstreet from the, the north from Hagerstown, to, get, to bring all his forces back together to be able to hold. And that's where we have the Battle of Antietam. And again, if that special order had not been found, um, McClellan still would have pursued Lee, but it probably the fighting would have happened somewhere else. So why it happened, where it happened, sometimes rides in history on very specific moments. And that the finding of that order is a very specific moment where that occurs. Now, the Battle of Antietam is going to be massive. It is going to be the single bloodiest day in American history. Nothing, no other battle in American history is bloodier you know, on that single, uh, single day battle than Antietam. You will have a couple of battles like the Battle of Gettysburg, which overall sees more casualties, but no other single day. In a series of attacks, and if you reference the map that I had, uh, the link that I had for the Battle of Antietam, and I'm just gonna show it here very briefly, you're going to see a series of attacks starting in the north about 6.30 in the morning, heading down south. There's going to be three major waves of attack starting under Hooker and Mansfield. Then you're going to have uh, uh, General Sumner. And then the southern portion is going to be um, an attack by General Burnside. It is going to be in places like the cornfield um, on uh, Sunken Lane, Burnside later called Burnside Bridge, where you're going to see um, wave after wave of attack occur. Um, when I do tours of that battlefield, which uh, I do a half day tour that's three and a half hours long, the details of which um, uh, are, are just absolutely moving. The personal information of individuals and the heroics of that day and the terrible sacrifices that were made uh, on that day are just astonishing. But the numbers sometimes really sort of drive home what happened. What we're going to have collectively is about 87,000 Union troops 
on the eastern side of Antietam Creek, attacking roughly 38,000, because now, now uh, uh, Stonewall Jackson is moving troops up from Harper's Ferry, uh, holding that position. And that's going to lead to 24,451 casualties on the day. Let me just do that as a comparison. One other battle that most people have heard of, D-Day, which happens on June 6, 1944. American deaths on that day, 2,501, with about 3,000 injured, so roughly about 3,500 casualties. Antietam, 24,451. It is the bloodiest day in American history. Now, Lee holds, in, 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 sort of, in, in some sort of tactical ways, it's, it's considered a draw, because Lee doesn't, doesn't retreat. It isn't a route. The next day, McClellan debates, or Lee debates holding and staying. Uh, fog sets in. There's a little bit of fighting going on, but nothing major. Uh, the next day, Lee decides to retreat, and he comes down. And it's the end of the first major um, invasion of the North. Now, that's going to lead us to the following year. whole bunch of stuff happens between September 17th, 1862, and the next invasion. And that's, uh, uh, you'll, you'll hear about battles like the Battle of Fredericksburg, the Battle of Chancellorsville, which are going to be two major victories for Robert E. Lee in, in Northern Virginia, which just like the year before is going to lead him to come to the conclusion that the only way he can possibly win this war is to invade the North. And that's going to lead to probably the most famous battle of the American Civil War, which is the Battle of Gettysburg. Now, the Battle of Gettysburg, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because it's not, it, for our purposes, it doesn't happen in Maryland. Uh, but the aftermath is what's more important for us. Uh, in the course of three days in the town of Gettysburg, the, um, we will have the, 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 the blood, the, 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 the battle with the most casualties in American history. It will lead to Robert E. Lee having to retreat, being pursued by uh, a general Meade. And it is that pursuit which is going to lead to two battles, which are going to be connected, uh, which I can connect to uh, the, the, uh, um, the battlefield that we're at here in Monocacy. Um, if you look at the, the um, uh, map that I sent you, it isn't about the Battle of Gettysburg, but it's about the retreat lines that occur uh, over the next couple of days. And that's gonna lead to um, two battles that happen in um, Maryland itself. The Battle of Williamsport, and the Battle of Boonesboro. Now, just very briefly, the Battle of Williamsport. The Battle of Williamsport is going to occur over a 10-day period. Lee is retreating. Meade is pursuing, although not as vigorously or aggressively as um, uh, President Lincoln uh, would like. One of the things about sort of themes about the Civil War is that on many occasions. This is going to be true with McClellan. It's going to be true with Burnside. It's going to be true with the Joseph Hooker, all of these other generals, that when they have some a a a aspect of advantage over Robert E. Lee and other, other forces in Northern Virginia, they don't take advantage and pursue aggressively. And the same thing happens in 1863. Meade has won the Battle of Gettysburg, but he's not pursuing and building and capitalizing on that. Now, historically, what I would say and one thing we have to remember is that a winning army is just as tired as a losing army. And so how aggressively you can pursue the enemy is often up to question. And sometimes politicians who are about 100 miles away from the actual battle itself think that the armies have a little bit more energy and sometimes are more organized than they thought that, that this order of battle is not as severe as it really was. So. Lincoln is disappointed in Lee in, in Meade's pursuit of Robert E. Lee, but he does pursue him. And a number of battles, sort of rolling battles, will occur in, in Pennsylvania and in Maryland as Lee is retreating. Williamsport is an important crossing point of the Potomac River. And on uh, July 6th, uh, the first um, uh, forward units, caval a cavalry unit of Robert E. Lee comes into Williamsport. Um, it's going to be led by Brigadier General Imboden, who is going to chase out of town uh, General John Buford's cavalry, uh, Union cavalry. And as they retreat, uh, they will alert Meade that there's a large force coming towards Williamsport. 
Um, late on the, the, the 7th, large numbers of Confederates start to spill into that town. Over the course of the next couple of days, over 7,000 injured Confederate soldiers will come into Williamsport. That town will become one vast hospital. Churches, houses will be taken over and will we'll hold and take care of these men for the next couple of days. Um, the uh, uh, hope of the Union Army, or sorry, the Confederate Army, is to retreat across the Potomac and get into Virginia. But because of a number of, because of rain that uh, has occurred over the last couple of days, the Potomac is pretty swollen. It's difficult to cross. So Lee is going to end up coming there on the, uh, uh, the next day and will decide to start, up to, to start to set up defensive positions. And on the 11th, a def massive defensive line has been set up around Williamsport. Now, um, on the 12th, Meade will start to arrive in large numbers, and he's going to start to probe. And between the 12th and the 16th, there's going to be running battles occurring all across that defensive line at Williamsport. Probably the most important moment, and there's little things happening here and there, is, uh, but the biggest thing is on the 14th, a large Union cavalry force will charge at the Confederate line, which will break temporarily. 500 Confederate soldiers will end up getting uh, captured. And, um, and, and that will start to shake Lee's confidence. Um, on the 15th, some more fighting takes place, but at the end of the, the evening of the 15th, the majority of the Confederate forces across the Potomac River, um, and the, 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 the battle starts to wind down. The last action is going to be a couple of running skirmishes as the uh, defensive line starts to shrink around Williamsport. Um, a number of men will have to be left behind, especially wounded uh, Confederate soldiers, and the, uh, the battle will be over. Now, while the Battle of Williamsport is occurring, um, another battle will take place a few miles away, known as the Battle of Boonesboro. If you take um, uh, this route, this is um, Route 15, over the Catoctin Mountains, through Middleton, and over South Mountain, you will end up in the town of Boonesboro. Um, Jeb Stewart, who a famous cavalry officer from the Confederate side, has the task of screening um, Lee's main force from the Union. So he's going to use the cavalry to sort of run up and down the line to sort of keep the Union from finding the main force of Lee. Um, he's going to uh, run into uh, uh, Union forces in the, ba uh, in the town of Boonesboro. And uh, he's going to meet a number of um, uh, New York uh, cavalry units under General Kilpatrick. Uh, uh, Buford's going to be there also with the 1st uh, uh, Division of Cavalry. Um, and these two units are going to collide at 11 a.m. on July 8, 1863. And this is going to be happening while things are going on at Williamsport a few miles away. Uh, Williamsport is just a little bit further to the north and to the west near Hagerstown. And also, just uh, to digress when I didn't mention this, um, the Battle of Williamsport also go by, goes by the name of the Battle of Hagerstown and the Battle of, of uh, Falling Water. There's another battle of fallen water that has nothing to do with this battle. So if you're ever looking up these battles, um, you'll, you'll find that the Battle of Williamsport goes by a couple of names. Um, so in Boonesboro at 11 o'clock, Jeb, uh, Jeb Stewart's going to collide with these cavalry forces. They both pull up artillery units. They're exchanging fire. They're testing each other's uh, strength on their, on their flanks. And around 5 o'clock in the evening, the left flank of the Confederate cavalry starts to fold. And they're starting to retreat back towards the South Mountain because that's at their backs at Boonesboro. Um, Jeb Stewart, in every instinct, tells him to pursue and to keep fighting. And he does for another hour or so. But by 7 o'clock, he realizes that there's no way he's going to be able to continue his pursuit because it would open up a gap between the main forces of Lee and his cavalry units. So he decides to fall back. And that's going to lead to the end of the Battle of Boonesboro. Now, interestingly enough, Jeb Stewart's going to fall back to a place called Funkstown, which is just um, south and east of Hagerstown. And two days later, he's going to engage cavalry units again. Um, the, that, that's not listed as an official battle in Maryland, but it, it has all the markings of a battle also. Again, all of these things are happening while we have well o almost 200,000 human beings retreating uh, and being pursued and pursuing, you know, this is the, the Union and the Confederacy 
from Pennsylvania all the way down to um, uh, Virginia. And that will end the second major invasion in 1864. Now, this is going to lead, or 18, sorry, 1863. And this is going to lead to the last two battles, which is going to be the Battle of Monocacy and Folks Mill, which are connected to one another. Now, I'm going to get out of the car in just a minute, and I'm going to talk a little bit about these battles in your two monuments. The first thing I'm going to show you, just very quickly, is a monument which is dedicated to the 67th, 87th, and 138th Pennsylvania. Those units will be here at the Battle of Monocacy, but they also were part of the units that were pursuing Lee in 1863 when he uh, was retreating from Gettysburg. So that's one of the connections. And then I'm going to take you to another monument, which is dedicated to the 10th Vermont Commissions, because we're actually at the battlefield that I'm about to talk about. Okay, so a little bit of background, and then I'm going to hop out. We have, in 1864, um, a series of major victories by Ulysses S. Grant um, in northern Virginia, which is known as the Overland Campaign. Spotsylvania Courthouse, the Wilderness, North Anna, uh, Cold Harbor, and by the summer of 1864, Robert E. Lee is surrounded by Ulysses S. Grant in a place called Petersburg, just south of Richmond. Lee is now in a desperate situation, and he turns to his general, Jubal Early, and says to him, I need you to do something. And what he does is he detaches Jubal Early and, and some of his forces to go on a uh, invasion of the North in an attempt to draw away the uh, forces from Petersburg. Now, just to give you a couple of numbers here, in, in 1862, Lee's going to invade with, at most, and these numbers are a little bit shaky when you go to different sources, at most 42,000 men to invade the North, which leads to Antietam. A year later, Lee's going to invade with the largest army under his command with 71,000. But in 1864, when he detaches Jubal early on this mission to invade the North, he can only muster up 14,000 soldiers. So you can just see how the battle of attrition over the course of years is bleeding the South. But he does, he detaches Jubal early. Jubal early goes to the Shenandoah Valley, which is right in modern day West Virginia, Virginia, sort of borders that, heads North, taking forces out in the Shenandoah, comes into Western Maryland, and on July 9th, 1864, will engage forces right where I am at uh, the Battle of Monocacy. So let me go out here and hopefully the wind will die down. I'll be standing by some trees, which might shade me. And hopefully um, you guys will be able to hear me. All right. So at the moment, I'm walking towards a monument that is dedicated towards to, to the Pennsylvania units that were here at the time. I could not park any closer to it, so I just take a minute walk here. All right, let me spin around here. So here is the monument to the 67. monument is where it is, is going to have to do with something right across the street. So let me sort of explain the Battle of Monocacy. Where I was earlier at my first stop when I showed you that special order 191, I was on the east side of the, or sorry, the west side of the river where the Confederate forces were coming down the Georgetown Pike. The bridge that I drove over had a covered bridge which was defended by 275 soldiers um, some dug in rifle pits, dug in and defending that bridge. The head of the um, uh, the head of uh, forces was an individual by the name of General Lou Wallace. General Lou Wallace was going to hold that bridge because he realized that what was happening was Jubal Early was either getting across the river to try to attack Washington, D.C., via this road over here, which is the Georgetown Pike, or he's gonna to try to cross about two miles north on the Baltimore uh, Pike to head to Baltimore. He didn't know which one they were attacking. 
once Jubal Early starts to attack that bridge, he knows where he's going. So he defends that bridge. Eventually, by the late morning, he's going to have to set fire to that bridge because he realizes he's heavily outnumbered. Lou Wallace, the Union general, has only about 5,600 men. Jubal Early, 14,000. There's only 275 individuals defending that bridge. And over the course of the morning, from about 8.30 to 11, six waves of attack will occur on that bridge. And at that point, the head of the, the military on the spot there, under a guy named General Ramser, is going to realize that crossing that bridge is just not feasible. So he sends forces south along the Monocacy River to find a place to ford. And he'll find a ford, a, a sort of a low point in the, in the river, known as the Worthington Ford. And the Worthington Farm, which you can see the red barn behind me, went about a mile and a half behind it, would be the Worthington Farm. Conf uh, cavalry units, Virginia cavalry units, will cross the river there, engage Illinois cavalry units, which will have to retreat. And now the, the Confederacy is on this side of the river. General Lew Wallace sets fire to that bridge, to, the, to the, uh, the covered bridge. But he doesn't warn all of the troops on the other side of the, the river that he's done that. And at that point, a guy named Lieutenant Davis is going to see that the bridge is on fire and realize he's trapped. He then does a running retreat towards another bridge about a half mile up a railroad bridge and rescues, helps uh, get those 275 men across. Because of that, he's going to get the Congressional Medal of Honor. Now, what we're also going to see is once the Confederate forces cross over, they're going to engage a strong skirmish line right where that red barn is. And we're gonna to start to see the first heavy attack occurring on this side of the river. At that point uh, where that red barn is, you're gonna have forces from Louisiana, Georgia, and Virginia coming up to attack this line. And what they're going to attack is the row of trees that you see behind me here. This is known as the final stand, the last stand. If this falls, Monocacy is over. The battle is over. This area is gonna be held by General Ricketts. General Ricketts is going to have uh, forces from the those three Pennsylvania units that I mentioned, the 67th, the 87th, and the 138th, lined up in the center of these trees. Further down, we have the 13th New Jersey, and then some New York units. But right here behind my shoulder is right where the Georgia, uh, the Georgetown Pike is, is, is um, uh, it turns. And it's at this turning point that this unit, the 10th Vermont, is going to hold this line. And it's at this point right here where a second Congressional Medal of Honor is going to be earned. It will be a, Charles, a private Charles Tanner, who's a um, flag bearer, that's going to retreat behind my shoulder here when the, when the line starts to fall. He's going to see that the American flag and that his regiment flag has fallen. He will run back to this point, receiving three wounds in the process, but retrieve those flags and, the, Congress, and the, the Medal of Honor will be earned at that day. So we have two Medals of Honor, Lieutenant Davis, part of the 10th Vermont, Charles, Private Charles Tanner, 10th Vermont. And that's why this monument is where it is today. Now, behind me here, the Confederate forces are moving up from the line, the, the red barn over there, moving up this field to this line of trees. Ricketts, who's in charge of the Union forces here, says to his forces, we'll hold until you see the CS on their belt buckles. He wants them to get really, really close, and they do. They get inside of this field here, and those men unleash six artillery pieces, unleash uh, um, uh, canister fire, and in the Battle of Monocacy, the Confederates are going to lose 900 men. It is estimated that about 600 of those 900 are going to fall here. And even though in terms of numbers, the, Monoc the Battle of Monocacy is smaller than, say, Gettysburg or Antietam, this is like the cornfield. This is like the mule shoe. This is like Sunken Lane. This is like the Devil's Den or the Peach Orchard. This is where the battle take really takes place. The Union falls back and has to retreat. 
The Battle of Monocacy is the northernmost victory for the Confederacy during the war. And initially, uh, Ulysses S. Grant is livid that Lew Wallace had lost the battle. If you take my tour, I'll talk about their relationship prior to the battle because they don't like one another anyway. But Ulysses S. Grant is livid that Lew Wallace retreats and he has this loss. But he realizes, and for Lew Wallace, this isn't a loss. He was able to delay these forces about 11 hours. And in doing so, the forces at Petersburg that Grant had were able to get detached and sent to Washington, D.C. So this bat, and, and then once uh, Jubal Early and his Confederate forces arrive in Washington, D.C. the next day, they're not able to take the Capitol, which was their main goal in the first place. So this is known as the battle that saved the Capitol. Now, that leads to our very last battle. One of the participants in Monocacy was a General McCausland in charge of Virginia Cavalry, who was actually going to race right down this road in the pursuit of Union Cavalry heading towards Washington, D.C. to warn them that the line has fallen and Confederates are coming. <clears throat> After the battle ends, Jubal Early goes to Washington, D.C. There's something called the Battle of Fort Stevens, which is not really a battle, it's a large skirmish, but nonetheless, um, and goes back into the South. McCausland, the, the, the Confederate uh, cavalry general, is going to be detached and head into the North for a series of raids, one of which is relatively famous in terms of the Civil War. That is going to be the burning of Chambersburg. Uh, a number of times, Confederate forces will come into the North and they will ransom towns. They will say, you have to pay us this amount of money or we're going to burn your town down. And this will happen in a place called Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. He burns that town. And then the following day, on make sure I get my right on August first, eighteen sixty four, after the Battle of Chambersburg, McCausen is coming back down south, and he will collide with Union forces a few miles east of uh, uh, Cumberland, Maryland. On August first, eighteen sixty four, the raiders went in and burned Chambersburg. Um, the Union forces, they'll start to exchange artillery with Union forces um, in that little valley. There's a really cool placard that's there. And I'll just say this as a, as a selfless plug. I do a whole bunch of short videos um, about different locations around the United States in terms of Civil War memorials and placards and locations. I did a, a really cool video of this about two weeks ago. And if you go to my Facebook page, it's FFC Historical Tours, you can see those videos. And I have the whole sort of thing laid out there. But at Folks Mill on August 1st, um, McCausland is going to fight a Union General, Benjamin Kelly. And both forces are going to bring up artillery pieces. They're going to exchange fire with one another. And from about 3 p.m. to 8 p.m. on August 1st, 1864, they'll fight one another. McCausland realizes he can't hold or attack because he doesn't understand the lay of the land like the Union, and he retreats thus ending the last battle of the Civil War in Maryland. That battle, sort of if we loop it back to the first battle we talked about, which is the Battle of Hancock, that battle is going to see 25 uh, casualties, just like at the Battle of Hancock. So for the battles in um, Maryland, we're going to start very, very small, we'll get to the bloodiest day of the Civil War with the Battle of Antietam, and then end with a small engagement. And that really is um, sort of the lecture. Those are the battlefields, all of which um, have a lot more history to them than what I've covered. But for our purposes, um, that is essentially where we're at. Maryland is a huge crossroads. I'm going to get back in my car now. Is a huge crossroads of the Civil War. Um, and we'll see a lot of action and we'll and see repercussions of other battles that occur outside of its state lines. Um, but that essentially is the, the, battle, the battles themselves. Um, Time-wise, are we good, good on time, um, Sean? Yeah, hey, um, Fred, yeah, we're doing good on time. I was just posting the link to your Facebook page. Um, I guess now would be a good time if anyone had any questions. We do have a question from Dan Mick, um, okay. who asked, uh, Dan asked, might the battlefield be, be affected by an expansion of I-270? Yes. Um, in, it, I-270 runs right through the middle of the battlefield. I'll, I'll sort of talk a little bit about battlefield preservation. 
the individual who um, helped save the battlefield of Monocacy was a guy named James Worthington, who was a six-year-old kid. He was five or six. He was very young. He was either five or six. Uh, very young kid. He was at the Worthington farm when the battle occurred. Um, and afterwards became very interested. He'd walk these fields, he'd find belt buckles, buttons, and things like that. And when he got older, he was a lawyer, and he heard about um, the destruction of parts of the battlefield, uh, of a battlefield of Washington, D.C., known as the Battle of Ox Hill or slash Chantilly. And that battlefield was gobbled up by um, residential expansion outside of Washington, D.C. So he's going to start to push Congress to set aside land here and in 1935, this battlefield will get designated uh, to be preserved. The purchasing of the land is not going to occur until really the 70s. And it's not going to be until the 90s that we'll start to see the visitor center open and really become a battlefield. But the uh, 270 goes right through the middle of the battlefield, which is unfortunate. But in terms of battlefields, this is a pretty well-preserved battlefield. I mean, there is a lot of the farmland has been purchased. Um, there are some other areas that the um, the national uh, the battlefield trust is, is trying to also obtain, especially in the northern part of the battlefield. But yeah, there has been some encroachment. And for um, people who do take my tour, if you ever come out here, you'll notice like the Frederick has expanded all the way to on the northern part, right to the edge of the battlefield. That first stop I was in, 200 yards away is a target. It's unfortunate, right? But fortunately, we've started to see the need to preserve these battlefields. Um, in terms of the other battlefields, um, Antietam is very well preserved, and the smaller ones um, you don't have a whole lot of preservation, but you fortunately do have some markers that give you an idea. Um, and, and a lot of the, the other ones, are most of them are in rural areas, so at the moment not overly threatened by um, uh, sort of residential commercial buildup. But, it, you know, it's always, always a potential uh, possibility that they'll, some of those battlefields will also disappear. So. Great. Well, we have a comment from um, Sam uh, Ketterman, and Sam also, during the chat, was able to, to uh, provide some additional uh, resources from the Adams County Historical Society. Um, Sam Samuel uh, said, uh, Jubal Early also demanded $200,000 from the city of Frederick before Monocacy. Did you want to comment on that? Sure. It's kind of a funny story. So uh, Jubal Early comes into Frederick, Maryland, um, demands this money, right? And the battle or the, the town of Fre um, Frederick initially said that they couldn't, they couldn't get it together. They don't have that much money, so they uh, end up sending uh, the mayor sends out people to the various banks. They do end up getting the money from five different banks. Uh, funny little anecdotal story is they show up with this cash, and, and Joe Baller doesn't want to check, right? He wants, he's like, I want gold or I want like you know, greenbacks. I want specie. I want stuff I could we can spend. Um, and they, they bring it and they're like, here, there, there's your money. And he says, now count it. And they're like, oh, my God. So they sit there and they count it. Um, the counting process will delay Jubal early from actually being on the battlefield at the first phase of it. There's going to be a general Ramser who's going to be in charge of the, the forces initially before Jubal early shows up. An interesting thing about Ramser is at 21, he became the youngest general of either army in the Civil War. Um, they count up the money. They come up two dollars and thirty-five cents short, and the mayor is like, "It's two dollars and freaking thirty-five cents." And Jubal is like, "If I don't get two dollars and thirty-five cents, I'm burning this town down." Uh, the mayor finds it, gives it to him, satisfies Jubal early, and doesn't burn that town down. So, yeah, that's that's the uh, the ransom uh, uh, of Frederick. So that does that definitely does happen. Great stuff. Um, so here's uh, I, we do have a. a um, our, our illustrious tour guide, Mike Radinsky, has a, uh, sent me a message he wants to remind everyone of, but this is a great opportunity for me to mention that not only does FFC Historical Tours do wonderful tours of Civil War battlefields, um, and actually, if, if we ever see the end of COVID, <laughs> he also does international history tours, but he also does, uh, Fred runs the walking tours in Old Ellicott City, Mike Radinsky, who is also one of our curators at the museum, is our tour guide for Ellicott City. So um, Mike wanted me to mention that Ellicott Mills' own Patapsco Guard took part as defenders during the burning of Chambersburg, delaying McCausland's cavalry long enough for citizens to evacuate. They spent a very cold winter 
uh, suffering in a burnout Chambersburg. So there is some local flavor there. Um, as here in Howard County, we, uh, we certainly want to, um, in the Howard County Historical Society, uh, we want to focus on what was going on here in, in Howard County and the Patapsco Guard was kind of the, uh, the, uh, the rear guard the, that defended um, Elk Ridge and, uh, and Ellicott City. Um, another question. Let me, mention, mm -hmm. let, let me make a quick yep. comment about what you just said. First, I was prepared for that. So shameless plug, walking tours at Ellicott City. So um, Mike Radinsky runs a great tour. We run them every Saturday. They start at 11 o'clock. We're running one tomorrow. So if you're interested after this, go sign up. So a nice little walk through town. And when you finish, stop and get some coffee, get a bite to eat. It's a great way to help out small businesses in Ellicott City. And then second, um, after Monocacy, Jubal Early is going to retreat. You know, this is roughly down where I-70 is today. So it's not the same, quite the same. But he's going to retreat back towards Baltimore. And he will stay in Ellicott City for a couple of days recuperating the, the forces. His forces are going to recuperate there after the Battle of Monocacy. So all of a sudden, um, in July, mid-July, uh, um, Ellicott City just gets flooded with uh, Union forces after this battle. Um, but you had a qu another question? Sean? Yes, and actually, let me uh, make a clarification. It was Ellicott Mills at that time, not Ellicott City sorry. yet. <laughs> Ellicott Mills. Sorry, sorry. Um, that's sorry. okay. That's all right. All right, Dan Mick with another question. Did Monocacy affect the plan to free prisoners? So... Part of the battle, now what you have to remember is with all of these battles, we just skimmed the surface. All of them have these smaller uh, aspects to it. Um, one of the things that, it's a great question um, in terms of monocacy. One of the things that Lee wanted to do, so there were sort of three major goals of Jubal Early's invasion. One, clear out the Shenandoah Valley, which he does. Two, attack the capital, which he kind of does, but really it doesn't mind effect. And the third was once he got into Maryland, and this is the one part of the plan where you just look at Lee and say, you are just grasping for anything at this point of the war. Because this really was pie in the sky, high hopes. He was supposed to detach part of his cavalry, which was going to swing through Maryland and go to Lookout Point in southern Maryland, where a large uh, prisoner of war camp was set up. And then the, that cavalry unit was supposed to sw swing, or, uh, swing around Baltimore, come down south, and go all the way to Lookout Point. And then they were supposed to liberate these uh, thousands of Confederate troops. Barges were going to show up. They were going to unload these soldiers onto these barges to come down to Petersburg, and then Lee could use them. How you were going to coordinate the logistics of a bunch of barges coming up the, the Chesapeake Bay at the same time uh, that the, these cavalry units have liberated these soldiers and all occur without the help of cell phones, I don't know how they were going to do that. Um, they, th those cavalry units do swing around and cause a tremendous amount of disturbance, but they do not liberate the uh, prisoners of war. And unfortunately for Lee, those thousands of troops were not able to help alleviate the pressure that he had in uh, Petersburg. A comment from Kenneth um, that Frederick didn't pay off the loan for almost a hundred years. <laughs> correct, um, correct. It was, <laughs> yeah, it was a, I think it was, uh, and I have my, I'm blanking right now. It's like 1977 or something like that. It's like, well, because those banks, they made them sign. And after the battle, they're like, we want to get paid. We didn't, not just here to give out money. We want our money back. And they, yeah, they ended up having to pay all that money back. So. Um, another comment from Samuel Ketterman uh, regarding the Patapsco guards that the, the Patapsco guard were also posted to Gettysburg after the battle. So that's also accurate. Um, I will say that if anyone is interested and has not visited the Museum of Howard County History, we are open in Old Ellicott City. We are back to our normal hours, uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And in the middle of our exhibit, we do have a um, exhibit in the middle of our exhibit space. We do have a significant um, exhibit on um, on the Civil War and its connections to Howard County. So uh, we do have that material at the museum. Uh, Gary. Uh, asks, what book on monocacy with troop movement maps do you recommend? Wow, I can think of a couple right off the bat. I will say there's one that we sell at the museum that is local. It's a, it's a, a small book and it's, um, uh, it's published by um, Jerry Harlow, the local historian on monocacy. Um, so that's something that we have at the museum. But Fred, do you have any other uh, 
um, uh, sources on Oxy you can recommend? That's a, that's a great question. I will promise to get to, to email you the title. If, if he wants to c contact me, I'm blanking on, on two books that I'm thinking of right now, the titles of them. But I will say the, the first book that was ever written was by, by Worthington, James Worthington. And it has a lot of great sort of anecdotes or some inaccuracies, but he has some great firsthand information about the battle. But there's an emerging Civil War series uh, that was written, and I am blanking um, on the title so um man i will i promise you that if he if if he puts in or tries to contact uh, through my ffc historical tours if he sends me an email i'll be more than happy to send it but of course that there's always one question during question time that that <laughs> lecturers and presenters always just blank and i guarantee you once i log off and i'm driving back home it's going to come to me like that so if you if you contact me i will be more than happy to send you these two titles which i'm blanking on right now so I'm going to say pass. I can't remember. <laughs> Sorry. I will. I will say that. I will say that at the archives on the second floor of the Miller Library, once we are up and running again, and uh, my understanding is the library will be opening uh, by appointment only uh, starting on Monday, April the fifth, with limited access. But uh, once we are up and running, we are um, in the middle of um, collecting. Uh, we're basically putting together a library of Civil War related books and materials. And these books used to be down at the museum, but we've moved uh, this because uh, it's kind of a research library to some extent. It obviously makes more sense of the archives. And um, we are collecting books uh, to continue that, um, that, that general uh, research library there. Um, there are a couple more questions and I think we got it. We're running out of time. So let me, oh, we have a, Carol Hess has asked us that, that controversial question that us historians always hate to answer, but here it is. Fred, any thoughts of changes in monuments being, uh, the removal of monuments? What, what's your feeling on that? Oh, boy. Do, do we have another hour? Um, <laughs> Such a nuanced here, question. Here's, Carol. here's my, here is my, um, I'm going to make it as brief as I possibly can. And, um, because it's, it, it's very complicated. Um, do I believe that all mo the monuments should go down? No. Do I believe that some of the monuments should go down? Yes. Um, I'll give a perfect example of one that should go down. In Antietam, there's a statue of Robert E. Lee right at the entrance point, when you, like the main road that goes into Sharpsburg. The reason that one should go down is that the place where that statue is located, Robert E. Lee was never there during the battle at that location. So why in the heck is that statue there? It should be gone. However, I see battlefields, and I'm not talking about statues that were put up in neighborhoods like uh, like in, in, like some that in Richmond where you have statues to people who never lived in Richmond, right? I'm not talking about renaming schools in the 1950s and 60s after Brown versus Board of Education was passed. I'm talking about uh, monuments and statues that are on battlefields, um, which I see as open museums. And those monuments on battlefields are depicting the units and the people that were there, just like we have in museums. I see them as open museums. And as long as the information on them is accurate, and as long as they are placed in the proper locations, because I have a lot of issues sometimes with locations and prominence of where they are, um, I see monuments on battlefields the same as I see um, relics that are inside of museums. That's how I see that. Now, when you get off of battlefields and you're going to um, monuments that are located other places, I always ask myself, who is it dedicated to? When was it erected? And what, what is its message? And then it gets into, then you get into some interesting conversations but i think the extremes on both end uh ends of that conversation tend to uh sim oversimplify it um and uh so i hope that i've answered your question um i'd be more than happy to go have a cup of coffee with you at some point and go into a lot more detail uh but uh that's for a future lecture so I, we start up one more right at the end <laughs> <laughs> oh well, i got one more question from uh sam uh ketterman who uh is very active today thanks sam for participating oh i'm sorry no this is from kenneth again i apologize 
Um, part of the 1864 uh, invasion, Gilmore's cavalry um, rode a, and camped through Maryland, including Howard County. And he tours or talks about that. Um, I would basically say, I don't think we have something now, but certainly we are looking to develop more content. Um, Fred, do you, any comment? I mean, it's all, everything is um, uh, time and um, uh, topic, you know, like I would love to, to talk about that. Like there's a bunch of units I would love to talk about in detail, but sometimes because where they, where their actions took place in terms of where I am, it's hard to connect all of that, but I'd love to one. I, I do, I, I do custom tours. So if somebody's interested, like I've done a tour where we followed a unit from uh, Gettysburg all the way down to Williamsport. We stopped at about a half dozen locations where they engaged uh, in that retreat line. Um, I had one person that said, I just want to go to as many places, as many battlefields as I can. Let's go for it. So we drove all over the place. And I showed them all these sort of obscure um, uh, uh, locations where things happened. Um, I mean, that unit that you talked about, absolutely worthy of being noted. Um, and love, yeah, would love to add that in terms of tours. Yeah. But it's yep. again, when you have two or three hours on a tour or like an hour in a lecture, what do you add? You know, like it's, it's hard to encapsulate all of that, but yeah, absolutely would love to add that. And lastly, and this is actually a question for me, um, Denise, thank you for joining us. Denise is one of our members who always comes on into our programs. Denise, the research library, uh, yes, it will be open. My understanding is if you wanna get in to see us, you gotta register through the library's website. You only have 45 minutes in the library. So um, you gotta make the best of that time. Um, and if you needed to come in and do work with us, Denise, um, get registered through the library first and then shoot an email to us. And so we know when you're coming in and, and we will do our best to accommodate whatever research needs that you have. Um, otherwise, if anyone, whether you're a member or non-member needs some research from us, we are taking online research requests and we can provide copies and digital copies and do as, as much research as we can for you um, under the current conditions. But um, it will be limited when the library opens back up. I'm sure they'll be phasing as they go along um, but certainly, um, as of now, you, uh, you can register for a 45 minute time slot to come into the library and come on upstairs and, and utilize our services. All right. I think that's it. We did it. Hey, <laughs> I want to thank everybody. I'm sorry about any technical glitches. Uh, this was kind of an experiment on our part. You guys were the guinea pigs for the first sort of virtual walking tour. Um, and I want to thank everybody for attending. And uh, just in time for everybody to go watch the Orioles. Happy open day, everyone. <laughs> go O's. Go O's. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. All right. And uh, we'll be in touch soon. Thank you very much.